it's almost time. Counting down. Hey, Richard, do you have Spotify? I do not. Oh, I was going to say, if you have Spotify, all you have to do is just play that in the background. I have um, YouTube music and you iTunes. Yeah. Yeah, just enable sound when you hit sharing screen, just enable sound and it should play, no problem. All right. Next time we're going to get some hearts of space before the before the show. We have to cut it out before we start recording or the copyright police to come and get us. I think everyone who needs to participate in the meeting has been marked as able to speak or as a co-presenter. If I've missed anybody, I apologize in advance. Feel free to harass us in the chat box when the time comes. But it's seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and start this month's edition of the Talking Heads. I mean, the CFIS Central Florida Astronomical Society. Thanks everyone for taking time out of your Wednesday evening this month uh, to join us as we talk about all things uh, astronomy for a little bit, a little while. So I think we have a good meeting uh, that you'll like tonight. Um, first, uh, after our announcements, our main speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Robert Zuber is going to talk about everything Mars. Uh, we are pretty much in progress of a huge invasion of the planet Mars. You're probably going to be hearing a, a lot about Mars um, yeah, in the near future. Uh, stick around after our main talk. We're going to have a uh, sneak peek at the new Cephas website. Uh, some of you probably didn't even know we're working on a new website. Uh, then we'll have our uh, mini programs, member Astro Photo Showcase with uh, Derek Demeter. Uh, Elaine Fisher is going to have an update about some uh, observing uh, opportunities uh, that we might have. Uh, our own solar system ambassador, uh, Sharife, is going to talk about the Mars 2020 rover. I'm going to spend just a minute on the moves, uh, then <laughs> just a minute on the moon, sorry. And uh, then John Pinto is going to talk about telescope math. And finally, our uh, excellent Taryn Hill is going to talk about uh, history of astronomy, and then we'll let you go for tonight. So uh, just some reminders, uh, every meeting, I like to remind everybody that our official uh, means of communication is through Groups.io. If you haven't subscribed yet, uh, please do so, cephas.groups.io. Uh, uh, we've been updating the wiki there as well. So a lot of uh, club documents and information is, is going on that group. Uh, Frank will probably talk about that a little bit later when we talk about the website uh, overhaul. Also, uh, if you have some astro photos, not only do we want to show them off at our club meetings, but uh, Shrife would like to use them for uh, social media purposes to show uh, what uh, Super Florida Astronomical Society members are doing with their uh, astro photos. I think it uh, goes without saying, I think that should include sketches uh, as well. Also, if you do any outreach opportunities um, impromptu or otherwise, be sure and let Lynn Ward know. Uh, he does keep track of that. Uh, and we do get credit with the NASA Night Sky uh, Network and, uh, you know, we get uh, accolades and bragging rights and all that sort of thing uh, for that. Uh, also, if you're just interested in participating in outreach, uh, also uh, email Lynn at this address as well. Upcoming events, of course, we're a little shy on events. Uh, we have been since we had to go virtual for most things. Uh, we're going to do a uh, simulcast of the uh, Perseverance landing. Uh, Mark Gillette, uh, Mark Gillette is uh, going to be simulcasting that. Not listed here, but Sharife uh, is also going to be doing something. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to steal her thunder, but she'll talk about that a little bit uh, later, what she's doing. And um, there is also a Scout Pack uh, Astronomy Night in Sanford at Lake Jessup Park. Uh, it is a no-touch event, so if you have a um, a electronic uh, assisted imaging system and you like to go. Uh, they're supposed to practice uh, you know, proper social distancing and all that sort of protocol. Uh, email Lynn Ward, uh, wardlr2012 at gmail.com and let him know uh, that you're interested in that. And uh, let's see, do we have, we, our, our guest speaker is uh, not quite here. I tell you what, we're gonna jump ahead to Frank since Frank just volunteered. Uh, Frank, I'm gonna stop sharing. And if you are able, I'll let you jump in and talk for a little bit. 
All right, so while we're waiting for uh, Dr. Zubrin, uh, let me show you guys a sneak peek at our new website. Uh, let me switch over to my screen sharing here. How about that one? All right, so as you know, the uh, existing CFIS website, uh, you know, it's getting a little bit dated, a little bit hard to maintain. There's a lot of stuff on there, but a lot of it's out of date because, you know, it's hard to maintain. So what we've been trying to do is make a new website that's really geared exclusively toward prospective members. So this is where people who aren't necessarily in CFIS yet will go to learn more about us and learn how to join CFIS, which wasn't really obvious how to do before. So we moved it to a more modern design that's just a single page, and it's just the bare essentials of what you need in order to learn about what we are and how to join us. So you see, we have this pretty little picture here that I licensed. It's, you know, don't worry, it's legal. Um, and yeah, it just kind of draws you in with a more modern design. Uh, right there, if you want to join, you can click on membership plans and go to that or learn more about us. Follow us on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram. And uh, the YouTube channel is also going to be getting an overhaul soon too, but uh, we'll have more about that later. And as you scroll down, you can see uh, we have our little About Us segment here. That's just the blurb about Cephas that we copied from the existing website. And uh, if you want to join, it's a lot easier now. You can just go down to the Membership Plans section and select Standard Patron or Student. It tells you what they all are, are different and how they all work. Hit the big Friendly Apply Now button, and that will take you straight to a page where you can pay for it. So uh, as opposed to like 10 clicks, you can now do this in like two clicks. So that's definitely progress. Um, and by the way, if you guys are going to be renewing your memberships uh, after this launches, this is how you'll do it as well. Moving on, we have a copy of our Facebook feed here for the events on our public Facebook page. So this, again, is geared toward the outside world. So these are our public events. It's not including our private events. I'll show you where that is in a minute. So coming up on uh, Friday, we're doing the Heavenly Love program with uh, me and Derek. So catch that if you can. And a couple of simulcasts coming up, too. Oh, and another virtual star party booked uh, next month as well. So, and uh, we also have the outreach request section here. So another use case of at the outside world trying to communicate with us is schools or Cub Scout groups, whatever it is, reaching out to us to do outreach re events. So if they want to do that, they can fill out this form and the information will go straight to our outreach chair, uh, Len. Finally, I think we're legally required to tell people who the officers are. So here's all of our smiling faces, mostly smiling faces. Uh, along with contact information. So if you ever need to contact anyone on the board or a chair directly, here are some handy dandy email links that will let you do so. And uh, the you know legal stuff at the bottom that we have to have. If you ever wanna read our bylaws and articles of incorporation because you know you want some really thrilling, gripping bedtime reading, you can check them out there. And again, this is for the outside world. For members, for you guys, remember that the members only site, which you can also get to here is uh, groups.io. If you head to cfest.groups.io, this will remain our repository of members only information. And just to give you a quick walkthrough here again, remember the messages tab here will lead you to the forums, which are also replicated on your email accounts. If you want to start a new topic, start a new conversation, please do hit the new topic tab for that. And we're populating the wiki section as well. So there were some resources on the old website that we want to not lose. And this is where we're moving them to. So we have a link here to... Um, doo -doo -doo. The reference desk, that's a new page that we've added. So this is where we're collecting some of the old resources on how to get started with astronomy and observing and some good magazines you might want to subscribe to, some good websites to check out and some good books. So uh, we'll continue to flesh this out over time. And finally, under files, there's some stuff you might find interesting as well. All the board meeting minutes, which we need to get up to date, by the way. Um, and other stuff, various stuff that we've uploaded from the past meetings, uh, observing logs, whatever you might need. But yeah, coming up in uh, probably a week or so, we'll be launching the new site and we will have a more modern presence at long last for CFAST.org. And I will turn it back to Richard. Thanks, Frank. That's really great. We really appreciate um, the time that you and uh, Sharife and uh, also Francisco, who's officially our, our good master, have put into this. It's been um, we've been needing to do it for a long time, and we are an all volunteer organization. And uh, so I'm very grateful for uh, the time that everybody's been uh, putting into that. So and it looks great. I think it looks fantastic. Uh, so thanks. And yeah, great. Francisco really laid the groundwork for it all. So you know, yeah. thanks, Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we are going to uh, spin things around a little bit. Uh, our uh, our main speaker is running a little bit behind. He is he, he we have we are in contact with him. He is on his way, um, and um, we're going to uh, 
we're going to switch to Sharife's talk on the Mars uh, rover. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Sharife. By the time she's done, uh, we should be ready for our uh, for our main speaker. That gives him plenty of time uh, to get on and get approved and settle down and catch his breath and so forth. So uh, Sharife is on there. I am going to be quiet and let her take it from here. All right. Thank you. So we are going to be, let me switch over to uh, my screen. I have a presentation on the Mars Perseverance landing and uh, go here. Share screen. There we go. All right. So get the slide full screen. Why is this working? Oops. What is going on? Okay. There we go. All right. So we're going to be talking about the Mars Perseverance and the Mars 2020 um, landing that I'm sure everyone is already familiar with. Um, and that will be happening on February 18th. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that from launch until where it's gonna be going when it lands on Mars. So this is me, you guys know me. <laughs> if you need to uh, contact me or anything, the best way to do that is through Instagram. Um, and that is my Instagram, my personal Instagram handle. What I'm gonna be doing on the 18th is a live stream. And it looks like I actually wrote something up there. I'm going to be doing a stream on Instagram and just kind of going through probably about 345 ish or something starting a live stream and then uh, talking through it so you're welcome to join and I'll talk more about that at the end. So I have a short video um, that you guys would probably find really interesting so let's get this started. All right, well, that is a very cool video and I'm very excited about it. Uh, so yeah, the launch um, lifted off from, Ken uh, from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on July 30th. And some of you guys might remember that uh, happening. And so here we are uh, several months later for it ready to be launched, uh, landing on Mars. So it launched on the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. Um, and yeah, so it was a collaborative effort. The logo, the, the mission patch for the Mars 2020, this whole thing is the, the Mars 2020 mission and the mission patches is, is the um, reddish uh, left icon that you see there. So mission timeline for how this is all gonna work, the launch and then the cruise approach and then entry, descent and landing and then the surface mission. So the cruise and approach is what is happening now and what has been happening since uh, the end of July. So as you can see the spacecraft is what's been uh, flying from Earth to Mars. Um, and then before, about 10 minutes before, it'll kind of shift and then separate, which we'll talk about a, a little bit in a second, into the entry, landing, and descent configuration. Um, and then it'll uh, land on, on Mars and then do, do its science. So in the beginning, when the payload fairing, before it was uh, encapsulated in the payload fairing, this is what it looked like. If you look at this, this over here, if you can see my cursor on the left hand side, you can see what the spacecraft looks like and it's upside down from the image on the right and uh, when it got up into space payload fairing separate the spacecraft was in there the top bold bold brownish part is the heat shield so that would be down here. And then this is the back shell, which is the aero shell it protects the rover uh, that's inside the descent stage is what's gonna actually be taking it from like a controlled descent from when it entered into Mars's atmosphere into the terrain. And then the rover is all tucked up inside 
Um, and then Ingenuity, which is the helicopter, is on the bottom of that. And then the heat shield goes on with everything else. And so it kind of just closes it up like, like an Oreo cookie. So a little bit more about the cruise stage, uh, which is pretty neat. That has, um, actually I'll go back, that has solar panels. It looks like a donut and there's a picture of it uh, coming up and it looks like a donut. And then it's got solar panels on the inside. It's also got two tanks, two propellant tanks that are on the bottom, which help it stay oriented with Earth at any given point on its travel from Earth to Mars. Um, so yeah, so this is a look at it before it was put in the payload bearing in the rocket. On the left-hand side, you can see the aeroshell and um, part of actually the cruise stage, the donut part was made is made out of aluminum and then it has the protective coating on the outside to protect it. Um, underneath here, this is before the bottom, the, uh, the heat shield is put on, you can see the Perseverance rover tucked up in there with the wheels folded in, um, the white area, the white cover on it are to protect the wheels. Um, and then that was obviously taken off before they sealed it up. If you look on the bottom right here in this area, that looks like an oil pan is actually where Ingenuity is, is uh, hidden up inside of Perseverance. And so I have an animation of that in a little bit that'll show how that all works once it lands. Um, and neat thing, they put a plaque for uh, to commemorate the COVID-19 healthcare workers and they put that on the side of Perseverance. So I thought that was a neat, neat little touch that they did that. So what is it going to be doing from Earth until Mars when it launched? Um, it has uh, it has trajectory correction maneuvers. There's six of them, and that's what's going to happen when the propellant um, inside of the cruise stage fires. It'll reorient itself using radio communication to Earth. It'll do that six times before it actually lands on the surface of Mars. So you can see the timeline of when that happened. Uh, right now, we should be probably about TCM4, so basically in the in the orbit of Mars. And then just before it'll it'll do one more correction, and then um, it'll be able to land on the surface. So this is what it looks like when it will separate, and it'll separate um, that part that I said was like an Oreo cookie. the The top cruise stage will separate from the rest of the spacecraft about ten minutes before entry into Martian uh, atmosphere, and so it'll separate and then burn up this part, the um, cruise stage. And the parachute that you see in the pictures is right here in the center of the white uh, back shell part. And so that will come down and then do the uh, descent onto Mars. So this kind of a lot of writing in here, little writing, but you can see how the, the timing of it is going to be um, from about 10 minutes before uh, it enters into the Martian atmosphere and then begins, you guys are probably familiar with the, the seven minutes of tear where it, it, you kind of lose communication with, with the rover and not really sure what's happening until it lands or doesn't. So the whole thing, the whole process from entry to landing takes about 6.8 minutes. And it's different, similar to Curiosity in that respect, but different because the technology is, is uh, more improved than, um, than with Curiosity. So you can see how it's landing, uh, the parachute, is deployed and then uh, what happened in my cursor? Oh well, there we go. And then it lands uh, using radio communication. And then um, this part, the sky crane, will separate the rover from the rest of the spacecraft. And then the descent part will fly away. And then uh, I believe I read somewhere that it actually explodes. And then the rover stays stays on the surface. So where is it going? It is going to the Jezero crater. And which is located, and as you can see, Anubis and I have landed safely on the surface of Mars. And it's landing on the Jezero Crater, which is a prehistoric uh, lake and river delta, basically. So the reason why they're going there is because it was once a lake that was several hundred feet deep. And so there might be microscopic fossils that they want to excavate in that area. So when uh, the rover lands, it will land in that green circle, and then it'll travel towards the left up the delta. Um, and you'll see a different picture of that also. It'll travel about 2,000 feet up the rim of the Jezero crater. So what it's going to be doing, the main mission of this, is to collect the fossils and also uh, survey the terrain and get chemical composition of the rocks. And as it collects and it drills samples of the soil, it'll be leaving some of the samples along the way. And then a future uh, spacecraft will come, future rover will come and collect those different samples and then take them back to Earth uh, for, for future study. So these are the four 
missions of, of the rover, uh, geology, like I said, is to study the rocks and landscape at the landing site, um, and then to determine any kind of signs of life, that any signs of possible life in the past, prehistoric life, or uh, in any signs of you know, any potential or anything, if it's suitable for that. So it's going to be collecting the samples and leaving there, leaving them there, um, and then basically testing different technology through the helicopter uh, ingenuity that we could use when we live and, and work potentially in Mars someday. So this is the main overview of some of the, the instruments that are on board. And I have a cheat sheet of what they are because I didn't memorize all of them. But they're basically camera systems. So MassCam is a camera system that's going to help determine mineralogy. SuperCam um, is going to be providing imaging and chemical composition analysis. Uh, Pixel is a spectrometer for um, elemental composition of the, the minerals on the surface. You have Sherlock and Watson, which is just, that's just awesome. And they're, they're going to be looking at uh, high detailed pictures and spectrometry of, of also of the, the Martian surface. And then MOXIE, which is going to be looking at uh, converting how to produce oxygen on the Martian surface from carbon compounds. And let's see, META is different uh, sensors of temperature, speed, direction, pressure, relative humidity, dust size, and shape. And then um, RIMFAX is a radar that's going to um, be able to determine the geological structure. So all these things are on there in addition to Ingenuity. And so Ingenuity will be the helicopter that is mounted on the bottom. And on the right-hand side in the picture, and the one of the engineers that was loading it into the bottom of uh, Perseverance, and that was kind of the look of it, and that's looking at the bottom of the helicopter, has two uh, cameras, two really high definition cameras, a black and white one, and then obviously a color one. On the left is how it's actually going to communicate. So it's going to communicate wirelessly with the rover, with the Perseverance rover, and also with Earth. So Earth can send the signal to the Perseverance rover, and then it will send the signal to uh, Ingenuity, which will then fly around and, and do its thing. So here's a picture of what it would, an illustration of what it would look like, and then a picture of it on the right for, for scale. And you can see the rotors and, and, uh, and the size. So the whole thing weighs about four pounds, uh, is going to be helpful for when, when it flies on Mars. And there is a difference between the atmosphere, obviously, on, on Mars and Earth. It would be like flying at about 100,000 feet on Earth. So they had to um, keep it light and, and do some different modifications for the aerodynamics for that. So here's another short video. Um, yeah. Oops, sorry about that. Fast forward, there we go. <laughs> Sorry again, <laughs> pop ups. All right, 
I could watch that video a million times. That was so cool. So some differences between the Curiosity rovers and Perseverance. Uh, these are some of the main differences, and a lot of them are uh, the technical specs of it. So the wheels are new and updated for better terrain um, updates, and then also the stabilization for the helicopter and for you know for for driving it up the uh, the crater, and then um, the tools that are on board along with the cameras. There's 23 cameras, and then uh, yeah, most of them are in color. So oh, it's, it's about the size of a minivan. I don't know if I had mentioned that just for size comparison. So if you guys got the boarding pass before um, launch, there was a way that you can sign up to get your boarding passes. So I got a boarding pass and Anubis, my dog, got we got our boarding passes. And so what happened with that is that the data from that was put onto the plate at the bottom. And so that was attached to the Perseverance rover. So if you guys did that, that's where you're at. And that's where you're gonna be when you get to Mars. So like I said, landing on February 18th on Thursday, and this is where it's going to be traveling to. So you can follow it along um, throughout its journey. And this is how you can watch. So the broadcast from the NASA Live will begin at about 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll get confirmation of landing at about 4, about 3.45 to 4 o'clock-ish. And like I said, I'm going to be going live on Instagram, and that's my Instagram handle and watching it and everything. If you guys want to join in live, you're welcome to do so. There's a lot of really cool information on uh, with all these pictures, more videos. I mean, just hundreds of, of resources out there. If you want to share or do anything like that with them, uh, the bottom two websites on the left, really great information. Um, so yeah. So what questions do you have? Any questions? I can stop sharing. Anything? <laughs> I think somebody had asked uh, the range of the uh, of the little helicopter. Um, I'm not sure what the range is, but I know that the flights are going to be about 90 seconds long, so not that not that long. Um, and they want to make sure that because it they ha they have to service it, they have to bring it back down to service it. It can't be serviced in flight, so they want to keep it short and and manageable for that reason. Yep. So, any other questions or? You're welcome to email me or anything later on. And, and if not, I think. Are there any missions in uh, in the planning stages to retrieve those rock samples? Not uh, not that I'm aware of. I know that that is the plan. And so they want to take other missions in the future, um, other rovers in the future to be able to do that. And so that I'm aware of, I don't know of anything that's actually planned though. And let's see, there was a question here. The individual cost of the rover, I'm not sure what the cost of, of everything was actually. Um, I know that they different parts of it were built in different areas. So like JPL did a big, most of it and then assembled in different areas. So I'm not actually sure what, what the cost of everything was. Let's see. Um, what features am I excited about for the rover? Hmm. I mean, personally, I think I think Ingenuity is, is neat because it's the first time that they've ever done anything like that. And then obviously getting the results back from um, from any kind of astrobiology that they might find. So yeah, what are you guys all excited about for it? You can write in the pan in the chat if you want and <laughs> fossils. Yeah. Life. Yeah. So yeah, fossils and all right, cool. Well. Collecting possible fossils, yeah, for sure. And it'll be neat because they had mentioned they showed like a timeline of uh, what kinds of things within, you know, the, the timeline of Mars they would actually be able to find life, evidence of life on. And it was kind of like the equivalent of what microbes and prehistory would be for us. Um, so yeah, and it will stream live on nasa.gov uh, slash live and it will start, uh, like I said, I think, what I say, 2.30 or something like that. You should be able to find it on there. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Sharifa. Do a great job as always. Thank you. And Trisha, are you alive? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So thank you guys for joining us this evening. I am super excited to introduce Dr. Robert Zubrin. After a short introduction, we will get him on. So if you guys don't know, Dr. Zubrin is a world-renowned author, inventor, engineer, and all around Mars expert. 
He's a president of Pioneer Astronautics. He has a BA in mathematics from the University of Rochester, MS in nuclear engineering, and MS in aeronautics and astronautics, and a PhD in nuclear engineering, all from the University of Washington. As a member, as a former member of NASA's Mars Exploration Long-Term Study Working Group, Dr. Zubrin has over 100 technical and non-technical publications in various areas of astronautical, aerospace, and nuclear engineering, as, and is also the editor for the Mars Exploration and for the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society. He is the holder of one US patent and has two more pending for advanced spacecraft transportation concepts. So let me thank you for thank you for coming and let me welcome Dr. Robert Zubrin. Are you there, Dr. Zubrin? Let's see. Um, okay. So it looks like I'm actually there we go. All right, I can see myself. So I definitely am here. Uh, uh, Teresa, um, what is the time frame that I should uh, uh, in my talk? About 45 to 50 minutes, including uh, Q&A. Okay, 45 to 50 minutes. Okay, thanks, I can work with that. That's great. Okay, so um, there's a revolution in space flight going on right now. And in fact, um, uh, I've got a new book that discusses it called The Case for Space, which you can see right back there. Um, and the full title is The Case for Space, How the Revolution in Space Flight uh, Opens Up a Future of Unlimited Possibilities. So the revolution, the, the unlimited possibilities in the case, that's an awful lot to talk about in 45 minutes, but uh, I'll try to touch on it. Um, so first, uh, let's talk about the revolution. Um, I think in this audience, uh, you must be somewhat aware of it. You probably all saw February 2018, just three years ago today, uh, not today, but this month, uh, the launch and landing of the Falcon Heavy launch vehicle. Now, this, of course, was extremely impressive. Everybody saw those two boosters come down and land together. It was almost like a ballet, um, you know, right at the Cape. It's phenomenal, something out of science fiction. And yeah, very impressive. But if you actually knew the backstory to that, it was more impressive because what had happened was back in 2009, uh, newly elected President Obama commissioned uh, my former boss, Norman Augustine, the CEO of Lockheed Martin, to uh, lead a Blue Libran committee to determine if President Bush's moon program um, was uh, feasible within uh, reasonable uh, resources, finances, and so forth. And they came to the conclusion it was not because according to them, development of a heavy lift vehicle would take at least 12 years and cost $35 billion. Now Musk actually went and testified to that committee and said that he could do it for $2.5 billion and they laughed him out of the room. Well, he went ahead and did it for less than $1 billion and it took six years. So half the time, a 30th of the money. And not only that, the vehicle is three quarters reusable. So what Musk did? Well, a couple of things. One is uh, over the past 10 years, he has uh, cut the cost of space launch by a factor of five from $10,000 a kilogram to $2,000 a kilogram after it had been steady at 10,000 a kilogram since 1970. That is for 40 years of stagnation. And then in 10 years, bang, it's down a factor of five. And more broadly, he's proven a point that it is possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team uh, to do things in the space flight area that was previously thought that only the governments of major powers to do uh, and do them in a fraction of the time and a tiny fraction of the cost. And by doing so, uh, he not, didn't just cut the cost of space launch, he launched a revolution. Um, he, uh, th there's now an international space race. Other people think they can do this too. People think they can do this better than him. 
uh, you know, Musk is, right? A little loose around the edges. A lot of people think that, uh, well, they can do it better and they're giving it a try. And, and not only are there um, uh, competitors here in the United States, you know, about Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos has now finally decided to leave Amazon to kick Blue Origin into action. And uh, But uh, I happen to know of at least five entrepreneur-led companies in China that have received major investment and which are attempting to uh, compete. Uh, I actually witnessed the launch of one of them who's developing a launch vehicle comparable to the Falcon 9. Um, and they'll probably have it in a couple of years. And Musk knows this, which is why he's not settling for his Falcons, which uh, are by far the most uh, cost-effective launch vehicles in the world today. He's trying to create a new generation, a fully reusable launch vehicle with, you know, five times the capability of the Falcon 9, double the capability of the Falcon Heavy, um, and, and fully reusable. So it will actually have the same launch capability as a Saturn V moon rocket, but perhaps 1% the cost. So by the time the Chinese have something that equals the Falcon 9, he's going to have something that makes the Falcon 9, i.e. his existing launch line, obsolete. Okay, now that's not uh, aerospace thinking, that's Silicon Valley thinking. Um, and uh, of course, that's where he's basically from, uh, and originally South Africa, but in terms of as an adult. Um, and uh, this is extraordinary. So this thing is cut and loose. And, you know, he's reduced the cost of space launch but from $10,000 to $2,000 a kilogram. With Starship, it'll be less than $500 a kilogram. Um, heading towards $100 a kilogram as uh, the, the system is increasingly uh, perfected. Um, now, the cheaper launch is, the more launches there are going to be. Um, and, you know, last year there were about 100 launches in the world. SpaceX got a quarter of them, which is to say more than half of those that you could compete for were taken by this one uh, medium-sized uh, company, uh, actually a very small company compared to Boeing or Lockheed Martin, large company compared to, to mine, but okay, a medium-sized company um, has taken uh, half the free world launch market. Uh, well, as launches get cheaper, there'll be more of them. And that means that spacecraft will get cheaper because they'll be produced in larger numbers and all the components that go with them uh, will be produced in larger numbers. And they will also get better because you see, uh, the cheaper space launch is, the less conservative spacecraft designers can be with their designs. If it costs a billion dollars to launch your satellite, you're not gonna introduce some new kind of battery or Star Tracker or RCS system or something to save 10 million here or there. Um, or to improve performance of something by 30%. You say, well, this basically works, I'm sticking with it. And in fact, the wisdom among spacecraft designers since about 1970, since by then pretty much anything you needed could be bought. That is all the necessary space technologies existed. So why settle for it? Why not settle for that? Why try to do something new when you have something proven that you can use? Um, and the wisdom has been, don't fly anything that hasn't flown before. You know, but that, that's like the person who won't see any movies he hasn't seen before because he doesn't want to see a bad one. So, you know, he saw The Wizard of Oz when he was a kid and that's a good movie and he's sticking with that. Well, you're not going to uh, see much new that way. You're not going to learn much. And so there's been stagnation, relatively speaking, in space technology for decades. And this is now going to cut loose. So we're going to have better systems of every kind, power, propulsion, guidance, navigation, communication. All this is, is, is going to get much better. Um, now, in addition, OK, so you have the space launch revolution that is uh, uh, going to accelerate a spacecraft revolution. Uh, and then there's another revolution that is going on uh, that I've been a participant in, which is um, turning the planets into places with resources. What do I mean by that? That is, uh, 
I believe there's no such thing as a, a natural resource. There's only natural raw materials. It is human technology that turns a raw material into a resource. You know, land was not a resource on earth until we invented agriculture and it has become a more valuable resource as agriculture has advanced. Um, oil was not a resource until we invented oil drilling and refining and, and machines that could run on the product. You know, if Napoleon Bonaparte was assessing the raw materials of a country that he was interested in conquering, they wouldn't even have listed oil, okay, let alone uranium or even aluminum, okay, um, which was basically unknown to science until just about the time Napoleon died and unknown to consumers until the 20th century. Um, you know, I mean, if you go into any uh, genuine antique shop and you're looking at artifacts from the 1800s or before, you won't see a single item made of aluminum. To the pioneers who went west, it was just dirt because they didn't have the technology to separate aluminum from aluminum oxide. Well, it's the same with the moon and Mars. Um, they will have resources when resourceful people are there. Uh, the, 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 you know, in other words, the moon, yes, it's moon dust is dirt, but it could also be turned into oxygen and steel. Um, and, and there's other things there too. Uh, so uh, the, the focus has been, um, and um, it's become increasingly accepted uh, that we have to develop technologies for turning extraterrestrial materials into resources. And this is for instance, fundamental to Musk's plan to send humans to Mars with a starship because it uses methane oxygen propellant, uh, which you know I've been a, a champion of. That was the basis of my Mars Direct plan. Don't bother with giant motherships constructed in Earth orbit with little landing craft that go down to the surface of Mars. Send the, 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 the habitat craft right down to the surface of Mars and come back from the surface of Mars with a vehicle fueled from methane oxygen made on the surface of Mars because Mars has got carbon dioxide and water and you can turn that into methane and oxygen. Um, and that's the plan uh, with Musk. It, it does it somewhat different than I originally proposed. I sent an Earth return vehicle to Mars first and then follow that up with a HAB, which you leave on Mars and leave the Earth return vehicle there. His plan is to go there and come back in, in the same ship. But it's the same basic idea. Uh, and this sort of thing becomes possible when you have these kinds of technologies, which are becoming increasingly well demonstrated. Um, the, now, I also think, uh, well, you take uh, Starship. Um, okay, uh, it's gonna open up additional types of markets uh, for space. Um, in particular, I believe uh, it or vehicles of its general kind will open up a much bigger market than satellite launch, which is intercontinental transport. You know, for the past 3000 years, uh, people have made money on the ocean, but uh, I mean, some of them have by actually extracting wealth from the ocean, for example, by fishing, uh, but, but a much larger amount of money has been made on the ocean, not by pulling fish out of the ocean, but by, using the ocean as a low drag medium of transport, connecting every port to every other port. And I mean, that's thousands of times bigger business than fishing and always has been. Uh, and the space is a ocean connecting every point on earth to every other point. It's an ocean with zero drag. And, uh, and if you travel through it, you can get to anywhere, to anywhere else on earth in less than an hour, okay? And, uh, and that is really something. Uh, you can travel from Los Angeles to Sydney in less than an hour instead of 18 hours on an uh, airliner. Uh, and uh, I think initially this sort of thing will have to be from ports because I think the takeoff and landing sites will have to be, you know, maybe 10 miles offshore to, keep the noise down, but still uh, it'll happen. And, um, and I've run the numbers and they're in the book. Uh, and what it works out to is if you're talking Starship, which is really just the first generation of this kind of vehicle, um, with a hundred passengers, you could make 
a fair amount of money running starships between Los Angeles and Sydney at $20,000 a seat. Now, uh, I have to confess to you, I have never bought an airplane ticket for $20,000 in my life. Um, and um, I won't until there are starships available. Um, because even though there are people that do, that is, that is the cost of a first class ticket from Los Angeles to Sydney right now. But all those people get for their extra $19,000 more than I would pay for that ticket is a bigger chair, a tablecloth and some drinks. Um, now, if we had um, fast transport, instead of taking the 18 hours that they have to take along with the rest of us riffraff back in economy, um, anyone who takes that get there in less than an hour and have half an hour of zero gravity and the view of the cosmos out the window um, during the trip. And now that, that, now you're talking. So I think that's a business and, you know, okay, there's a hundred satellite launches last year. As the thing gets cheaper, there'll be 200, 300. There's hundreds of intercontinental flights every hour. And if the, the rockets can open up that market, then you have a reason to have thousands of starships uh, and not three or six. Uh, and of course, you know, Musk over there in Boca Chica is building, has built a shipyard. They're turning out these starships right now at a rate of one a month and he is hiring. Um, you can check the ads, he's hiring. And uh, they intend to be able to turn these out several a week. Um, and of course, this is integral to his development strategy, which is not to analyze something for 12 years before you try to fly, but launch it, fly it, crash it, figure out what went wrong and launch the next one. And they're, you know, bullying ahead in this. And, you know, um, at this point, they got through, you know, 90% of their flight profile, uh, there's another 10% they have to figure out how to do, uh, but they will. And if Starship number 10 doesn't do it, 11 will do it uh, and 12. And, and those are already mostly built. Um, so there they go. Anyway, um, so this is gonna be a thing. Now, look, a vehicle that can fly Los Angeles to Sydney can also just stay in orbit. And maybe you're not interested in going to Australia. Maybe you're interested in just experiencing space. Well, then you sign up for a trip that will go into orbit and orbit three or four times and take you back down to the ground after six hours in space. Uh, and, and that's business too. It's like people that take boat rides around Manhattan you know, just to be on a boat and see what things are like from there. Um, all right, well, all right, fine. So that's space tourism and uh, really a lot more to it than joy rides of four minutes in, in zero gravity on a suborbital thing. Um, but what if you want to spend a week in space? Well, it doesn't make sense to have a ship that can travel back and forth across the world uh, every day and make money that way to stick it up in orbit for a week and, 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 and not be able to use it for a week. So then at that point, we're going to see space hotels, bring the passengers up there, let them hang out in the space hotel, the starship comes down, it can do another mission tomorrow. Um, and uh, so, you know, Bigelow, that was his plan with the Bigelow Space Hotels. In the 1990s, it didn't make sense. There was no way to launch it and certainly no way to get to it. Um, but now, you know, uh, he was as head of, ahead of his time. Time is catching up with him. So we'll see space hotels and orbital research labs and even orbital industries. Um, but great, but you know, as far as I'm concerned though, space isn't about just earth orbital activities. It is about going across space to explore and settle the worlds on the other side of space. Just like ultimately ships are not about experiencing the ocean, they're about going across the ocean to the places on the other side of the ocean. And uh, I think there's gonna have to be some government involvement with this at this point. Um, the business plan uh, for satellite constellation is um, clear enough. Uh, may or may not work, but it, it's certainly uh, quite plausible and, and Musk is trying it. The business plan for orbital research labs and such 
are, are uh, um, understandable. But the business uh, plan for colonizing the moon and Mars at this point is not that clear. And furthermore, um, it requires some technologies um, that don't have a commercial case outside of settling the moon or Mars. So see, I actually think we're going to land on Mars by 2030 with people. Um, and even though that is not on any NASA planning chart or ESA planning chart, might be on a Chinese planning chart, but I haven't seen the chart. Um, the, but what's happening is this, Musk wants to go to Mars because Musk understands that the real purpose of this entire space venture is not to launch communication satellites. It's to transform humanity into a multi-planet spacefaring species. And I'll talk about why that's important in a bit, but he understands why that's important and that's what he wants to do. And that's why he's developed Starship, okay? It's not to make money, he already has all the money he needs. And if he wanted to make money, he wouldn't do it with a rocket company. There's a lot of easier ways to make money, okay? He's gonna make money with SpaceX because he's great at making money, but you could make more money with a chain of candy stores. I mean, the, 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 the uh, this is um, what it's about. Now, so he's plugging away at Starship and you know, Musk of course is very uh, optimistic in terms of schedule, um, according to what he announced in October, 2019, Starship should have reached orbit already. And now he's saying it's gonna reach orbit this year. I think there's only an outside chance of that happening personally. I think there's a fair chance he'll do it next year. I think it'll reach the stratosphere this year, uh, suborbital flight, but not orbit. But I think he'll reach orbit next year. And if he doesn't, he'll certainly reach orbit the year after. And by 2024, starships are gonna be traveling to orbit regularly. Uh, it's gonna be a regular thing. It's not even gonna be particularly exciting. Um, I mean, maybe some of you will bother to go to the launch, because, but you know, most people lose track. Um, but whoever's elected president in 2024, looking at this, is going to turn to his or her advisors and say, wow, look at this. And he says he wants to send people to Mars. We work with them. Could we get people to Mars by the end of my second term? Answer is yes. Well, will it cost hundreds of billions of dollars? No, it can probably be done within NASA's existing budget. And you're right. He needs some help because there's stuff he needs that he doesn't have. He has developed the biggest single part, the transportation system, but there's stuff he needs. If you wanna make the return propellant on Mars, you're gonna need power on Mars. It means he's gonna need a nuke, okay? And it's gonna be really hard for SpaceX to develop a multi-megawatt space nuclear power system or any space nuclear power system because it involves controlled material. Space nuclear reactors use highly enriched uranium. And uh, that's not available to entrepreneurs. It's a controlled substance. And uh, so that's the kind of thing that the government is much better suited to develop. Uh, and there's an, a lot of other stuff that's needed, which SpaceX could in principle develop, but it'd be strictly a cost. Mars spacesuits, Mars vehicles, the ISRU technology, et cetera, uh, are not commercial in the same sense that uh, the Starship is. So it, once again, this is a call for the government. So I think we can um, create a Am I muted? Um, we can hear you now. You were just muted for a second. OK. I don't know how Sorry, that happened. That was me. That was an accident. OK. Um, all right. So by making the mission feasible, Musk is gonna make it sellable uh, and it will be sold and will be on Mars by 2030 as a result. Um, because he's gonna make it attractive enough that uh, the, uh, the political class will finally rise to the occasion, meet him halfway and we will do this together. Uh, and I kind of like that because I think uh, we should participate in this. It shouldn't just be them doing this, this should be us doing this. And in fact, I would like and hope that we would invite uh, our friends and allies in Europe, Japan, Australia, uh, India, uh, other countries and, that are part of what you might call the Western Alliance, speak, speaking in the broadest terms, uh, to, to all join in on this. Um, 
And if the Chinese launch a venture, I, I'm um, in favor of that too. Although given the nature of the situation, I don't think we can um, jointly develop technology, but we can, you know, we'll bring our ship, they'll bring their ship. Maybe the Russians will get back in the game. We'll have three ships and sail to Mars together or there to help each other and can compete for honors in um, who can do the most discoveries on Mars. Um, and, um, and then beyond that, you know, there's the outer solar system, the technologies. Once we have a base on Mars, uh, then space propulsion will advance. You know, people, uh, nobody even 50 years after Columbus would have crossed the Atlantic Ocean in the kinds of ships he did it. Um, the ships Columbus used to cross the ocean were not designed for the Atlantic for a very good reason. Nobody was sailing the Atlantic and I mean, offshore. Uh, but once Western civilization became transatlantic, naval architecture advanced to meet the challenge. And within 50 years, you had three mastered caravels and then clipper ships and then steamboats and ocean liners and eventually Boeing 747s. And I think the same thing will happen with Mars. Um, and you know, the first generation will go to Mars and start ships and they'll take six months to get there. And their grandkids won't really even believe it uh, when they hear the stories or their grandparents uh, of, of what the passage was like. Just like, you know, some of us of, of my generation, you know, our, our immigrant parents or grandparents who crossed the Atlantic in tramp steamers and the bilge eating the orange peels thrown down to them by the first class passengers on the top deck. You know, when we crossed the Atlantic in, 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 in six hours in comfort on an airliner. Um, well, that's how it's going to be. So, you know, they, they hear the stories of the six month passage and, you know, but they'll be doing it in themselves in a week on a fusion powered space liner. And the same ships that make it um, a matter of ease and luxury to travel from Earth to Mars will make it possible for braver spirits to go to the stars. And, and that's where this goes. If we, we do what we can do in, in our time, which is establish those first human settlements on, on, on Mars in particular, uh, then, you know, 300 years from now, there will be new nations on Mars. And on thousands of planets orbiting stars in this region of the galaxy. Talking new nations, new languages, new literatures, uh, new forms of social organization, uh, innumerable contributions to science and technology uh, created for the purpose of meeting the challenges of those planets, but which then become available to all. New histories of heroic deeds, um, which will inspire people to go further and do greater things. And, and, and that is something that we can create or cause to develop. And if you have it in your power to create something grand and wonderful like that, then you should. So, but uh, I'm gonna talk now a little bit more about why we need to do it other than it would be really grand to do it. Uh, although that's a pretty good reason um, is, is for four reasons. One is for the science, the second is for the challenge, the third is for our survival, and uh, the fourth is for the future. And let me explain all those. First of all, the science. You know, um, physics, most of what we know about physics, we learned through astronomy. Classical physics, gravitation came from astronomy on Kepler's laws is what led to Newton's laws. And um, electromagnetism, a substantial part of it came from astronomy. Relativity certainly came from astronomy. Uh, uh, nuclear fusion was discovered through astronomy. And, you know, and, and this is because the universe is like the best lab there is. It's the biggest, it's got the highest energy accelerators. It's, it's where you can really do physics. And um, there's no better place to do astronomy than space. And if we have cheap space launch, and space operations capabilities, which will also develop rapidly as a result of cheaper space launch. We're gonna be able to build giant telescopes. We're gonna be able to build telescopes in space that compare to Hubble as Hubble compares to Galileo's 
two inch telescope. And the, the, and, and the level of discovery, it will be phenomenal. And also by going places, so you can go to Mars. I think we're gonna find life on Mars. Um, I'm actually fairly sure about that. And uh, the reason why I believe that is because there was life on earth uh, virtually as soon as there could be. We have fossils of life on earth going back 3.5 billion years. And we have biomarkers going back 3.7 billion years, which is to say right to the end of the heavy bombardment. So in other words, there's no evidence that the earth was ever habitable uh, for microorganisms and sterile at the same time. In fact, the evidence is exactly the opposite. The earth was hab inhabited as soon as it could be inhabited. And well, that means one of two things is true. Um, and, and by the way, the early Mars was very similar to the early Earth. It was warm, it was wet, it had carbon dioxide, atmosphere, flowing water, uh, and rocks and things, and not particularly different. Um, so what do we know about why life appear on the early Earth? There's only two ways. Either it evolved indigenously, which means that the processes leading to from chemistry to biology through complexification are of high probability and they just happen. Like you put water outside on a cold night, it's gonna freeze into ice. It's not a matter of chance, it's what happens and the crystals form and there it is. And now if that's the case, it means life is everywhere. Although not necessarily the same kind of life as we see here, because while uh, you can make a strong case that life should be based on the carbon atom because of all its bonding capabilities and water because of, of the, the kinds of reactions it allows and so forth. Um, you know, so carbon water type life, yeah, you can make an a priori argument for that and why those are the best chemicals to start building life out of. But DNA and RNA, that's very idiosyncratic. It uses a particular set of amino acids. It could just as easily have used different ones. It might've even used different kinds of things than amino acids. So it's like, you know, all life on earth uses DNA and RNA. We have one information system for all life on earth. And that's like, you know, the Latin alphabet. We use the Latin alphabet. The French use the Latin alphabet. The Chinese, uh, no, excuse me, the Spanish use the Latin alphabet. Germans, Poles, okay. And why? Uh, well, most of, because most of those countries were conquered by the Romans and they left their alphabet with us and other countries nearby like Germany and Poland picked it up too. But the Russian alphabet is different. Um, it uses some different letters, but it does use the same principles. And even the Arabic alphabet, which uses uh, totally different letters, also uses the same principles. That is using symbols to make sounds. But the Chinese alphabet is totally different. It does not share a common origin with all those other alphabets. The, the Latin alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, the Arabic alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet all have a common origin with the Phoenician alphabet. The Chinese alphabet has a different origin and it works on a different set of principles altogether. It doesn't work on the principles of sounds, it works on the principles of pictures. Yet it serves the same function. You can write books in it, okay? Lots of books, uh, all kinds of books, just like we can. And so that's the question with life. Is everybody using the Latin alphabet? or variants of the Phoenician alphabet? Or are there different kinds of life and different information systems altogether? That we can find out by going to Mars. And because, but we're gonna to have to go there with people and drill and reach the groundwater because that is where, if there's life on Mars, it is to be found. Um, the, the Perseverance conceivably might find fossils on the surface of Mars, I hope it does. Uh, although it will be hard because fossil hunting is, is hard and requires a greater degree of mobility uh, and other tricks to be done than, than these rovers have. But, but what it certainly can't find is the extant life, which is in the groundwater. For that, we'll have to go. So to find out the truth about physics, to find out the truth about biology, we need to go to space. Then there's um, the challenge. Um, I think that societies are like individuals. We grow when we challenge ourselves, we stagnate when we do not. I think a Humans to Mars program would be a tremendous challenge uh, to every country that chose to participate, in particular to the youth that would say to every young person, learn your science and you could become a pioneer of new worlds. And out of that, 
we'd get, just as we got during Apollo, we doubled our science graduates at every level, high school, college, PhD. You know, I, I myself were one of those kids who went into science because of Apollo. Um, I happened to be unusual in my generation uh, because uh, I actually ended up doing space, but I mean, the rest of them went off and did the computer revolution. And that's why they all have a lot more money than me. But even so, I mean, there you have it. Uh, it Silicon Valley was not created by NASA, but it was created by people who were inspired by the space program and to become technical. And, you know, okay, we're not going to find the cure to COVID on the space station, but you can bet your bottom dollars that these teams that are coming up with these vaccines um, include a lot of people who became biologists because they were excited about the challenge of science from, from uh, the space program. And if we had a really bold space program like we once had, the numbers of the, such people would greatly increase. And, and this is the basis of the strength of any society. It's military strength, it's industrial strength, it's health itself depends upon its intellectual capital. And there's no stronger engine for creating intellectual capital than a bold space program. Um, and then there's our survival. Okay. I mean, people, a lot of people don't realize where the earth is. The earth is in space. And everything that's in space is moving around and really very fast. Okay? Earth is moving around at 30 kilometers a second. And so are most of the other objects are, you know, around uh, in the solar system are moving at comparable speeds and they're constantly crashing into each other um, with a devastating fact. Um, the um, well, very devastating on the smaller objects. I mean, everybody talks about how the asteroid killed the dinosaurs. Look what the Earth did to that asteroid. You can hardly find any remains. But there you have it. Okay, the, these things cause mass extinctions. And you say, oh, well, that only happens once in a while. Well, actually, uh, no, it happens a lot more frequently than you think. Uh, of course, people know about Tunguska, the uh, meteor that hit Siberia in, in 1908. Uh, if it landed five hours later, it would have destroyed London. Um, and just December 2018, we had uh, a meteor blow up over the Bering Sea with an energy uh, 10 times the Hiroshima bomb. Um, and um, we have to take control of the flight traffic. And we can only do this if we become spacefaring. Um, so uh, I, I don't agree with people who say, well, we need to go to space so that when the next asteroid destroys the Earth, there's some survivors somewhere else. I, I don't, th that argument to me is, is absurd. We're not going into space to desert the Earth. We're going into space to protect the Earth because only a spacefaring species can protect its planet. Because if we go into space, we gain the capability of diverting asteroids so they do not hit the Earth. Um, and, and, and there you have it. And you know, Carl Sagan once said, you know, all species either become spacefaring or extinct. And that is the case. So if we don't go extinct, we got to become spacefaring. Um, and then finally, there's the future. Now, I talked a bit earlier about the grand future that we can create, and that's one of the futures that's worth discussing. But there, there's another future, which is the near future. And the near future is very much determined by how people conceive of the far future. And what, what do I mean by that? I mean, look, what is the major threat to humanity today? Well, if you ask most people who think about such things, I think the biggest answer, the most common answer you get right nowadays is climate change. There might be some people say resource exhaustion, even some that say overpopulation. And these are all issues that um, are serious, um, but none of them were the cause of the great disasters of the 20th century. The great disasters of the 20th century were caused by something else entirely, and that was bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea. And that idea was there isn't enough for everybody. That is the idea that created World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, you name it. Um, you know, um, 
1912, General Friedrich von Bernhardi, chief intellectual on the German general staff, published an international bestseller. It's called Germany in the Next War. You can probably still find it. Um, and in that book, he said, look, you know, there's only so much here. And Eurasia is either going to go to us Germans or to the Russians. So we're going to have to fight them out for it sooner or later. Should it be sooner or later? Well, clearly sooner because we got to destroy them before they industrialize. And so two years later, they took advantage of the assassination of the Archduke to launch World War I. Let's settle this now. And that's the seminal catastrophe of the 20th century that set in motion most of the rest. 1939, Hitler, even more hysterically, Germany needs living space. The laws of existence require uninterrupted killing so that the better may live. This is all nonsense, okay? Germany never needed living space. Germany today is smaller than the Third Reich. It has a larger population and a vastly higher standard of living, which was achieved not by conquering other people's territories, exterminating them and stealing their cows, okay? But through the advance of science and technology, which has been a global enterprise, to which Germans certainly have contributed, but so have people of many other countries and races, including notably uh, uh, some of those they were trying very hard to exterminate. Okay, uh, And had they been successful, had they won, they'd be much poorer than they are today, um, not richer. Um, and But there you have it. But they did this because this was all in their heads. And, and today, I happen to know for a fact, because I have spoken with them, that there are people in influential positions in America's national security establishment who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Because there's 1.3 billion of them, you see. And if they had a standard of living like us and started all had cars and started driving them around and carrying on like Americans and Europeans, there wouldn't be enough oil and other resources in the world, okay? and. You can bet your bottom dollar that there are people just like them in Beijing who look at this problem from the opposite side of the chessboard and think exactly the same thing, except they've got different people in mind that they want to get rid of. Okay, And if this is the kind of thinking that is allowed to prevail, there, there's going to be war. And it will be a much worse war than the wars of the 20th century because our weaponry is far more devastating today than anything they had. And now, but this is a form of insanity. It's insanity, okay? Because, I mean, look, why is China rapidly developing right now? What has been responsible for a, a, a tenfold rise in China living standards in the past 20 years? Well, it's Western technology. You know, things like electricity and information technology, say nothing of internal combustion engines and all this other stuff that was developed in the West. Okay, so they all owe it all to us. Well, sort of, but we also owe it all to them because of the technologies like paper and printing that were developed in China that allowed us to have our Renaissance in the first place. And so the, the, the actual truth is that the, the nations of the earth are not in a struggle for existence over limited resources. Rather, we are an unruly family, but nevertheless, a family of nations engaged in a joint enterprise to expand the possibilities of human existence. And the more of us there are in the game, the more inventors there are going to be, and the more inventions, the more resources, because in, resources are defined by inventions, and inventions are cumulative. Okay, um, but people don't see that. Okay, people see, well, here's the Earth. It's just so big. Its resources must be finite. There's only so much to go around. Okay, it seems intuitive. It's false, but it's intuitive. But you see. We can refute that sensuously by going to Mars, by showing that there's no point fighting over provinces when there are whole planets that can be developed if we work together and use our genius together to create vast new prospects. So that it, it's, it's simply not true that there's only so much to go around on Earth because the Earth comes with an infinite sky and we can throw it wide open. And that's the case for space. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Let's take questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so the first question we have here 
From John Pinto, if we find life on Mars, how will we know it is indigenous to Mars or if it came from Earth rocks? Okay, uh, well, it's um, simple. Uh, okay, if we find life on Mars, which is different from life on Earth, either fundamentally because um, it uses something else than DNA and RNA, or even if it uses DNA, but it is of a form that we don't see on Earth, then um, it's indigenous. If we find life that is identical to Earth life, um, then uh, the question of whether it is native or not, uh, whether it was brought by the astronauts or not, words, let's say you find E. coli on Mars, okay? Did you bring it or is, was it there before? Well, if it was there before, it will have left traces, it will have left fossils, because by definition, if it was there before, it was there in the past, that's what before means, and uh, we'll know that it was there before we got there for the same reason we know that there was life on Earth before we got here, uh, by fossils. Um, and, you know, the, the only people who don't believe that are creationists who, who think that, you know, God created the Earth with the fossils in it. Uh, but no, Earth has a past and it's documented in its fossil record. And if we find fossils left by bacteria or other microbes on Mars, and they do leave fossils, um, then we will know they were there before us. If you find E. coli on Mars and no fossils or biomarkers, then you brought it. Okay, next question. Let's see from Frank Kane. Does establishing a permanent self-sustaining interplanetary colony depend on terraforming? Um, no, but terraforming will certainly greatly expand um, the scope of interplanetary civilization. Um, and, um, and I think we will terraform. Um, I think actually we'll probably terraform the earth first. Uh, that is most of the earth, you know, 60% of the earth is desert. And I'm not referring to deserts on land. I'm referring to 90% of the open ocean is desert. And that's because of a lack of trace minerals in the water if you're away from the continental shells or upwelling areas. Um, and so they are uh, have almost no biological productivity. If we were to fertilize those with trace elements, we could create uh, massive amounts of marine life and incidentally take up um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And, and, and that, in my view, actually is, is the uh, answer to carbon emissions, put them to work. Um, at the same time, we greatly expand the, the Earth's uh, biosphere. But the um, but Mars, yeah, uh, we'll be able to terraform it. It's harder than terraforming the Earth, uh, but uh, we will um, because it's the nature of life to take barren environments and transform them into those that are friendly for the development of life. That that is the history of life on Earth. Uh, in the case of Mars, I think we'll do it by producing greenhouse gases on Mars. Uh, we you know we know how to greenhouse a planet, but showing that and. And if we really wanted to do it on purpose, we could do it uh, much more effectively than we're doing it by accident on Earth right now. Uh, we would produce designer gases, fluorocarbon gases. And um, you know, the greenhouse effect on Earth has raised the temperature of the planet by one degree centigrade since 1870. We could raise Mars 10 degrees centigrade in 50 years. Uh, it, it, and um, that that'd be something, that'd be substantial. Uh, that would cause massive amounts of carbon dioxide to outgas from the soil, which would thicken the atmosphere, add to the greenhouse effect, uh, provide radiation shielding to the surface, raise temperatures enough that the frozen water would start to flow, the rivers of Mars would flow again, the lakes would fill, there'd be rain. And uh, at that point, you could start letting loose life. Okay, we have three more questions here. Uh, this next one is from Richard uh, Wright. He asks, with this mass proliferation and launches, how are we mitigating the growing prob problem with space-borne debris? Okay. Uh, by the way, before I answer that question seriously, I will tell everyone here uh, who has Netflix, there is 
a movie called Space Sweepers. It was produced in Korea. And the space sweepers are uh, the riffraff employed to sweep up space debris. And it's really a hoot. So um, I'll just mention that. It's a pretty funny movie. But the, uh, but yeah, but we're going to need space sweepers. Um, we're going to need to develop the technology to sweep this stuff up. We're going to need to have guidelines. I mean, most of the debris, you know, is a result of, um, how can I put it, littering. Uh, it's not actual satellites. It's parts of upper stages and, you know, pyro systems and separation systems and all kinds of junk. Uh, and basically, there needs to be agreement that everything but the satellite gets deorbited. Okay, I'm here, sorry about that. Next question from John Pinto. With more people working and meeting remotely, is it really realistic that there will be enough demand for Starship tr type transportation? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, you know, they, when they introduced computers, they said um, this will eliminate the need for paper. We know how that turned out. Uh, yeah. I think more communication with people around the world will create a greater desire for travel. Uh, you know, if you have friends in, in dozens of countries, this creates, and, and business relationships that are international and so forth, it creates more cause for travel, not less. Okay, I like that answer. Uh, our last question here is from Roy Harvey. He says, exciting talk. Thank you, doctor. There is so much focus on carbon footprints and pollution. Can you speak about methane oxygen fuel systems and future innovation innovations in propulsion systems? Well, methane oxygen, um, I became a champion of methane oxygen in 1990 because it was the um, easiest high performing propellant to produce on Mars. So if you wanted to make your return propellant on Mars, that was the choice. Um, it is the second highest performing propellant after hydrogen oxygen, but much denser, easier to store, um, ha has many advantages. Uh, and, um, and now, uh, in addition to the fact that you can make it on Mars, uh, it's also the cheapest propellant uh, for use on Earth. Now, if you have expendable rockets, the cost of propellants really isn't very high on your list of concerns because if you're throwing away the whole rocket, it really doesn't matter whether your propellant costs 10 cents a gallon or $10 a gallon. You know, the, the serious money is in the hardware. Uh, and the other thing is all 1% kind of thing. But, the, but if you have intercontinental travel, uh, then just like airliners, um, they're concerned about fuel costs. Well, you know, uh, liquid natural gas has is, is got like um, one tenth the cost of, of, of kerosene. And, uh, and, and for instance, the numbers I gave you for what it would cost to fly starships around the world um, or what, it would, what you'd have to charge passengers is conditioned upon using cheap propellant. If you use expensive propellants, the costs would start getting a lot more. Now, methane uh, is the cheapest propellant. Uh, it also, uh, well, uh, hydrogen oxygen has lower CO2 emissions. It has none from the rocket, but making the hydrogen has plenty of CO2 emissions um, and um, more so than you'd get from a methane oxygen rocket just using methane. Um, and of course, methane has become uh, a, a fuel of choice for uh, electricity because it is less uh, carbon intensive than either coal or oil. Um, now, we need to make, uh, we need to use chemical fuels for uh, takeoff from Earth. Uh, but in space, uh, eventually, I think we're gonna make much more use of nuclear propulsion. Um, but that is, uh, and I think we're gonna make much more use of nuclear power for on Earth, actually, if you wanna know. Uh, there really is no other answer. Um, but um, I don't know if that answers the question. 
That does. Um, we actually have two more. Um, I don't know if you have a couple more minutes. Um, maybe we can just uh, get these out real quick. Uh, Todd Parker asks, regarding power requirements for fuel production on Mars, I was wondering if solar panels are sufficient. You bluntly stated that we need we, we will need nukes for that. Have you done the math? Yeah, I have. Um, okay, when I designed the Mars Direct plan, we needed 100 tons of propellant for my Earth return vehicle to come back from Mars. And that required a power plant of about 100 kilowatts. And that would be about a football field's worth of solar panels. Um, and uh, assuming that you didn't have a dust storm that shut you down for a month or two. Um, the Musk plan with a Starship uses 10 times as much propellant. It would need uh, at least eight, maybe 10 football fields of solar panels. This starts getting out of hand. Uh, and then the, 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 the bigger problem uh, is that the power is unreliable uh, because of the uh, possibility of dust storms uh, on Mars that can uh, basically black out solar panels for even months at a time. Um, and so you really do want to have nuclear power on Mars. I would tend to agree. Uh, so this is literally our last question. Uh, this is from Robert Russo. He says, interesting bioethics discussion, if you find life. Can we ethically terraform, which may cause the extin extinction of another species? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, I, I think the idea that we could cause microbes in the Martian groundwater to go extinct is fantastical. Uh, because, you know, the Earth's original inhabitants were anaerobic organisms, and um, the photosynthetic plants made the surface of the Earth uninhabitable for them by putting oxygen in the atmosphere. And so around three billion years ago, they retreated underground into the groundwater, and they're still there. Um, they're still there today. Uh, after three billion years, with this whole gigantic biosphere carrying on on the surface, and dinosaurs come and go, and mastodons come and go, and the Wehrmacht come and go, and you know the human race will be long gone, and they'll still be there. Um, and similarly, if we terraform Mars, uh, if there is a, a Martian uh, life in its groundwater, we're not going to affect it any more um, than we're, we've affected the Earth's uh, groundwater organisms. But if you want to view this question more narrowly, if you take the hypothetical, uh, what if we did drive microbes into extinction? Um, is that ethical to create a fully living planet on the surface at that cost? And I would say absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. Uh, the idea that those microbes need to be preserved at all costs is not an ethical argument, it's an aesthetic argument, okay? And uh, it, it, it just is. It's like saying, um, is it ethical to use a vaccine because you might kill a bunch of coronaviruses? Uh, have you thought about it from their point of view? Um, you know, this is the one argument I haven't heard from anti-vaxxers. Um, that it's unethical to kill viruses. Um, the, 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 I mean, because it's just too fantastical. Um, and ethics ultimately have to be human-centered. They really do. I mean, look, you know, Albert Schweitzer went to Africa and he killed billions of microbes. And we don't uh, uh, call him a mass murderer for doing that. We call him uh, a saint to have gone there and, and saved all these human lives at the cost of billions of microbes. Adolf Hitler created a banquet for billions of microbes by turning people into corpses. We call we say that he's evil and he was uh, for doing exactly that. Um, so so I, I believe that ethics is got to be humanistic based. Now the that is not to say that we don't care about the environment. In other words, for example, if you say, uh, should we preserve the rainforest? Uh, I would say yes. Why? Because a world with a rainforest is a better world for people than a world without one. 
But if the world was nothing but rainforest and somebody said, well, can we clear this land here so we can have some farms? I'd say, sure. Uh, even though we would have destroyed the homes of variety of forest life, uh, th there's a balance there. So in other words, we wanna create the best possible world for people that does include having a world that is rich in wildlife. Um, but, you know, this argument that we would endanger native microbes. There are some people who actually go so far as to compare it to, well, if we were to harm them, it'd be like what we did to the Indians. You know, we just came over, pushed them out of the way, killed most of them, put the rest on reservations. We destroyed the buffaloes too, and most of the redwoods. Wasn't this a bad thing? Well, there, there's an argument. Okay, because you see the Indians, Native Americans um, uh, were people and that's why harming them was bad. And the bison and the redwoods were majestic creatures who added something. And so we destroyed that world and we created this world. And this world has a lot to offer too. You know, we've got a continental nation of 330 million people, which has produced half the inventions in the, in the world over the past hundred years. And it's got universities and used bookstores and all kinds of cool stuff. And you say, okay, we created something valuable at the expense of something valuable. All right, I'll buy that there's an argument there. I happen to be personally on the side of uh, that on net we created more than we destroyed. But I, I will nevertheless grant that something of great value was destroyed in that process. However, if there had been nothing here when Columbus landed, but a desert with some microbes in the groundwater, and we had turned that into what we have here now, would anybody be picketing Columbus Day parades? I don't think so. I'm back here. Um, that's actually a good uh, segue um, to uh, you know my favorite topic that you speak on, and that is the planetary protection stuff. I think uh, you're probably one of the strongest voices in that arena. So we appreciate you. Um, so thank you very much for your time. We uh, we had a really good discussion, and uh, thanks again. Hope to have you uh, back before too long. Okay, my pleasure. And once again, uh, I got two books. One is called uh, The Case for Space, which really was most of what I was talking today. And then I have my older book, The Case for Mars. And by the way, the 25th anniversary edition of it just came out. So if you haven't awesome. read either of those, check them out. All right, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so that much. Was, okay. That was fantastic. And I just bought both books on Amazon during the Q&A. So uh, I think Trisha, yes, yeah, she posted a posted to the chat box uh, an Amazon link uh, to the books. So, wow, that was great. I'm having a hard time bringing myself back down to earth um, to a meeting to uh, a meeting to run, uh, but uh, that was um, that's going to be one of my favorite uh, speakers uh, in, a, in a long while. Very inspiring. So our next mini program though, uh, getting back to business is our astral photos and sketches uh, from members. Uh, that's on uh, Derek uh, Deniver's plate who curates that for us. Uh, Derek, are you ready to jump in? Or are you in space too? No, no, I'm, I'm, well, I'm always in space all the time. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here just like we usually do uh, for those that are brand new to the meeting uh, we showcase some of the amazing stuff that our members are uh, contributing to the astro photography and of course uh, astro illustration and also some uh, some amateur astronomy research um, so if you um, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and um, I believe some of our panelists have the ability to um, to search uh, our attendees here to help me with that um, if you want to go ahead and ask them to unmute themselves they can talk a little bit about some of the uh, things that they worked on. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and start here. Um, the first one actually is easy because it belongs to Richard Wright. So Richard, you're already unmuted. So go ahead and um, Thanks. Uh, talk about that. 
All right, so this is my uh, full moon uh, image. Um, this is actually a three panel mosaic. My original project, I call it Mega Moon. I used a DSLR and a long focal length, uh, Matt Cassegrain, uh, to do this mosaic. And the, uh, you know, the zoom internet compression really doesn't do it justice. There's, I, I just, you know, for a full moon, there's just a tremendous amount of detail uh, on the moon if you uh, adjust the contrast so that it's not all this giant uh, white disc. Uh, a lot of the uh, rays and ejecta blankets along the left, uh, along the right hand side, you can see, this was only about six hours after actual full moon. You can see um, on the uh, eastern limb where the sun is just grazing uh, the, the craters. On the right hand side or the western side, there's also some bumps and those bumps are actually lunar terrain. Uh, the moon is not a smooth sphere and uh, that, that showed up as well uh, in the image. And I just love all of the subtle variations uh, around it. So the moon is, is actually my favorite um, celestial object uh, really to observe. And uh, so that's, uh, that's why I took this. Processing wise, um, my lunar processing advice is don't be too quick to uh, sharpen. Uh, use, the, um, use the curves and uh, tools first. Uh, get the contrast and the levels where you want them to be and then uh, do any sharpening. Uh, you'll find you have to do, you know, if you're well focused, um, there's very, very little sharpening you need to do. Uh, just a very, very light amount of, uh, uh, to touch it up. I didn't have to do any fancy wavelets, not at this focal length, uh, you know, to get, to get the detail because it's not stacked images uh, or anything uh, like that. But um, yeah, there's my, there's my full moon from just this last, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Great. Thank you, Richard. Great work on that. All right, we're now going to move on to um, some sketches. This is from our resident sketcher, Bill Castro. I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk, Bill, if you want to talk a little about your work here. Okay. Um, yeah, this was at the conjunction of Jupiter Saturn uh, a little while back. What was neat about this, not so much the images I drew, but I had a field star I was able to see through the eyepiece. And you can see the relative motion uh, of the both planets. Uh, you see Jupiter is moving a little bit quicker than the other uh, planet Saturn. And I've got things, uh, some of the moons labeled there as well. The one on the top was taken on the 19th. The middle one is on the 21st. And the bottom one was on the 22nd. So it kind of shows how, how things progress. All right, fantastic. Yes, that uh, is a nice, you can definitely tell the difference between each day and um, time and, and, uh, and all that. So uh, great work, Bill. Thank you so much for sharing that. So, all right. Uh, our next image uh, comes from actually some of the uh, photometry work from our, um, our member, Barbara Harris. So Barbara, can you tell us a little about your work here? Okay. Uh... I submitted this to hopefully get more people into doing something scientific with their, their astrophotography. Um, on the left is a 30 second image of the eclipsing binary star ZZ Boo. Um, it was done on January 27th and the light curve is to the right. It's about three, and, uh, about three hours of data. Uh, about 200 images. And the predicted minimum uh, for the eclipse of ZZ Boo was around 718 universal time. Um, there's software that's uh, out there that, that you could import your data and it would uh, calculate the predicted uh, minimum for your light curve. And um, the um, observed minimum for my light curve uh, turned out to be seven, uh, 719 universal time. So it was only a minute off of what was predicted. And sometimes it could be 10 minutes, it could be half an hour or so uh, off. 
And some people will ask, well, if we know what time the eclipse is going to be, why do we need to observe it and, and, and measure that, um, that eclipse? And the reason is that sometimes there might be something else going on in the, the system so that a change in the predicted eclipse time could indicate that uh, there's something going on and you could, uh, they could look for whatever it is going on. But this was an easy setup. This is a, a Canon 40D on my 80 millimeter Orion refractor and uh, 30 second images. The, the star went from about 7.15 to 7.45. So a 0.3 millimeter drop, which was easy to detect. Um, so I, I would encourage people to, to start doing work like this with their camera. It's pretty straightforward, easy to do. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara, for that. Yeah. It's always, it's amazing that you don't always have to take pretty pictures. Um, you can actually do some really cool scientific, uh, work there. All right. Um, our next image um, is from Robert Russo. Let me go ahead and go down here to find you. There you are. So, uh, Robert, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. So go ahead and talk a little about your work here. Okay, well, if you followed uh, our Facebook um, location, you've, you've seen all of this uh, before. This is actually my first deep space object I've ever taken a picture of outside of a little attempt with an alt -avs to get Orion. Um, with all its problems of this picture, I thought it actually came out pretty well. Um, this is 60 images, 120 seconds each, um, ISO 1600 using a Rokinon 135 millimeter, and this was at f2.0. Um, great learning curve. Uh, f2.0 is way too fast for what I need, and uh, as soon as I have some clear skies, we're going to try f2.8. Um, but this is also part of my process of trying to introduce people into you don't have to spend a second mortgage to actually get some decent pictures. Um, I, I equate it to people who rate, you know, race RX-7s versus people who race Ferraris. Um, both are fun. Um, and one is a lifetime goal and the other one is what you can do on the weekends. Um, so that's it. This is on a Skyguider Pro that I've kind of uh, modified and, and worked on the worm gears and uh, ring gears. And um, I'm actually in the middle of um, lathing a old uh, AVX mount right now on its bearings to get the uh, guiding down to, you know, 0.7 or 0.5. I'm below one now on an AVX mount, and I think I can hit 0.7 or even 0.5 with some uh, machining work that I'm doing right now. All right. Thank you, uh, Robert. Yeah, I like your analogy there about the uh, use of uh, the equipment. Uh, in fact, actually, I, I find that the best equipment um, is uh, something that you can, is what you use. And, uh, and, and it's amazing what you can capture with some of these wide field telescopes. I actually find it more enjoyable sometimes that way. All right. Our next image uh, belongs to Frank Kane. Frank, tell us about this image here. All right, you're looking at Thor's helmet, a uh, emission nebula in the southern sky, somewhere. I forget the actual uh, constellation. I think it's Ursa uh, Major. Uh, I don't know. Major, yep. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, uh, yeah, this is a, about 13 and a half hours of total exposure time. It's uh, RGB filters enhanced with hydrogen alpha and oxygen three to kind of bring out those blues and reds a little bit more. And uh, if you look closely in the background, you can kind of see those reddish hydrogen clouds being blown out there from the, from the inner. Uh, workings of that nebula. So that's something I never saw before. So that was a pretty cool thing to discover. Uh, also some new image processing tricks here that I tried out, uh, you know, instead of trying to make narrowband look like visible light, I just enhanced the visible light image with narrowband data and uh, that yields much nicer stars and stuff. Same uh, equipment that I've been using for the past couple of years, a Paramount Mighty Mount with a Skywatcher 190MN Mac Newtonian telescope and a Attic 383L plus camera. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you, Frank. Uh, this image here is of the uh, flame and horsehead nebula. This is one of my images uh, taken with the same telescope that Frank uses, a 190 millimeter Mac Newtonian. Um, I used a Canon cooled um, and modified camera. Um, and this is a, a series of different exposures. So I've done uh, several five minute exposures, 
one minute exposures and 20 second exposures and blended them all together to get those de depth. Uh, many of these nebulas here get blown out as well as the stars get blown out when you do those higher or longer exposures to get the uh, more fainter nebula uh, material here. So um, in order to do that and make it look nice and def uh, dynamic, uh, taking those multiple exposures will allow, and blending them together will allow you to get that nice depth. And so you don't have anything really blown out uh, in the image there. And this was uh, taken um, over at the Bull Creek Wildlife Management Area. And I figured um, while I'm here, I want to let you know that uh, I did speak with the game warden over at Bull Creek. Uh, last time I was there and uh, pretty much we are allowed to go there at any time, no need for a permit. Um, you can use the site 24 hours. Um, so go out there uh, on our nice dark nights, one of the darkest places within about an hour and 15 minute drive from most locations in Central Florida, um, hour, hour, hour and a half or so. Uh, so this is a great location. Uh, another image that I got a chance to image from this location is the Boogeyman Nebula, which is a large dark nebula region found in Orion. Um, this is a quite a challenging object because of its low surface brightness. So it took uh, a lot of exposure time to really get that, that detail out um, of that dark nebulae there. Um, this is located in the constellation Orion as well as the flame in Horsehead Nebulas, which you saw earlier. Uh, this too also required a lot of exposure time um, over about five hours worth of exposure time at about five minutes each, 60, uh, 65 minutes sub exposures. Uh, same equipment. I also use a sky, uh, sky, a software BIS mighty mount for my images as well. Um, and, uh, so as you can see, going to places like Bull Creek, um, and, uh, we'll, we'll, our, our is a great opportunity. If you get a chance to go out, hopefully maybe in the future, when things start to improve, we'll be able to set up a uh, uh, observing night in the future. Um, but we'll probably hold those off for a little bit longer until things start to improve uh, with the pandemic. But hopefully we can start doing some uh, sanctioned CFIS observing nights uh, out at some of these dark locations. And uh, that's pretty much all I have for this evening. So thank you so much for, um, for taking the time to check it out. Also, don't forget if you have any images please be sure to submit them to me uh, before the meetings and I'll be happy to share them. Thank you so much. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for uh, doing that for everybody. Uh, on the topic of observing, uh, Aline Fisher has a quick update for us. Unmute myself. Um, this is kind of good news, bad news. Mauricio started a conversation on um, the Facebook page about viewing from the Bar Street Trailhead at the Little Big Econ State Forest. And the question became, is that permitted? And I know the management of uh, the state forests in Seminole County, so I got a hold of them. And uh, we do need a permit. So I applied for a permit and got one uh, for us to be at the Bar Street Trailhead. They're all 426 after hours. Um, and I will post that um, first thing tomorrow morning. But good news, bad news. That's the good news. We can use that site. We, we have permission. Anyone want to guess what the bad news is? You can only do it during the day. Mm, getting close. <laughs> they oh. are in the process of installing lights, street lights. So Couple, couple of months, we're good with that. But uh, then there will be street lights at that location. Can so we, we can go back to uh, the power uh, switch. Oh, uh, I was gonna say, is, are these gonna be uh, new, the new forward down LED lights or do we have any idea of what kind of fixtures they're putting in? Um, I don't know, I can ask Steve. Um, he did suggest that up off of Snow Hill, I know that, uh, I think it was Bill used the equestrian area. We, we are not limited to the equestrian area. We can go out behind the um, forestry office there off of Snow Hill Road. And that is a very big open area um, with limited lighting. Um, I'll check it out at night. And I know Mauricio was going down to Seminole Ranch off Wheeler Road 
Um, I don't know of any plans to put additional lighting out there. Cool. If it's cut off lighting, sometimes you can kind of get around that. You just set up away from the light. Um, well, and they're going to light the parking lot, but that field is enormous. Mm -hmm. So there will still be opportunities to get away from the, um, the lighting. But I will post um, the permit. And then state forests are a fee area. Um, they, ask for, they ask for $2 per person uh, use fees. And I will post that information also. OK, great. We'll watch that on Groups IO then. Thanks, Elaine. OK, well, next up is uh, me. I'm going to spend just a minute on the moon. First, I have to share my screen. So many buttons to click. And this month's minute is on the mysteries of the Aristarchus Plateau. So located well to the north of Kepler uh, in the Sea of Storms. Let me get my mouse over here. Well, I've got a red thing around it you can see is one of the most unusual structural features on the moon. It's an elevated rectangular or a diamond shaped patch approximately 100 by about 125 miles uh, in, in size. And it rises approximately 15,000 feet above the plains around it. Zooming a little closer, you can see it really stands out uh, both photographically and visually. Uh, the more or less straight edges suggest fracture boundaries and the whole area is dusted by a pale mustard colored pyroclastic deposit. Uh, it's one of the few places uh, on the moon where they, they're, they're actual pyroclastic uh, activity uh, from volcanic vents. And of course the pale mustard colored, uh, you need to, <clears throat> it's, not, it's not easy to see that uh, uh, visually. The crater itself, Aristarchus, which is this bright one right here, it is uh, 40 kilometers wide and it's the brightest crater on the moon at a very young age of only 175 million years old. It's not the youngest crater on the moon though, that is uh, by Tycho, which is only 109 million years uh, old, which I think is very fascinating. Back in the time of dinosaurs, uh, you know, they saw uh, this 175 million years ago and then Tycho only a little over 100 million years ago. I can imagine a dinosaur civilization saying maybe we should do something about it, but uh, people were more worried about their Dino 1Ks to uh, invest in a space program. Uh, you can't see them from Earth, but the floor of Aristarchus, the bright crater, has numerous uh, volcanic domes with uh, crater pits. You can see it in LRO uh, imagery, but you can't see it uh, from Earth with a giant telescope. And I'll talk more about the uh, volcanism, uh, volcanism in the area in a minute. Herodotus, the neighboring uh, uh, crater, which is much, uh, much, uh, much shallower at only 4,200 feet, and 22 uh, miles across. This is also the home to the moon's largest sinuous rill, six kilometers wide at the mouth, tapered down to th uh, three kilometers. This area right here is called the um, is called the Cobra Head, and it's a legit volcanic vent. Uh, there's lava came out of there and formed that rill, and we can see in our imagery uh, the evidence of, of those lava flows and, of course, the uh, volcanic. Uh, uh, pyroclastic uh, material that's settled over the region. Now, really interesting about this area is in April of 1787, Sir William Herschel reported seeing bright illuminations here, red light. And because where the moon's terminator was, it wasn't the light glinting off of the top of features. There was something else on the moon creating the, those red uh, lights. He saw it again uh, in 1783, Wait a minute, I have those years backwards. Anyway, in May of 1783, he saw it. You can juxtapose this. But a few years apart, uh, he observed this uh, when the area was not limited, illuminated by the sun and was deep enough in earth shine that there could be no other cause. He even wrote about it in his observations that it couldn't be caused by earth shine uh, because of the conditions at the time. He thought that there was legitimately something going on on the moon there uh, glowing red. Uh, in 1963, it was observed again, red spot eruptions that were observed here, uh, but there's no photographic evidence to back it up. Uh, there were visual observations. Uh, Follow-up orbital observations of the area at high resolution show that there are lava flows there and there is evidence of volcanism, but nothing con conclusive to show that it was very recent. In other words, the features there are consistent with recent volcanic activity on the moon, 
but not conclusive. Uh, scientists are quite sure that the moon is too cold, that there's not enough heat reservoir left to power any volcanic activity. I kind of think that this is a lot like when amateurs were observing the spokes on Saturn's rings. I'll let you Google that if you want. And scientists were sure there were no spoke. This was, this was a phenomena of amateurs imagination until of course we sent spacecraft there and said, oh look, there are these features that people have been observing for years. So pretty cool. Could the moon have active volcanism going on? Well, time will tell. And if you're a member of ALPO, uh, people are watching this area and photographing this area all the time, uh, hoping that they'll be the one to catch something uh, going on if it happens. That's the end of a minute on the moon. That uh, maybe was two minutes talking. Next month, we're going to talk about the crater Poseidonus. And uh, if that's also the uh, February lunar challenge, uh, observe, sketch, or photograph Poseidonus uh, if you like. And I'll have more to say about Poseidonus uh, next month for the next minute on the moon. And that's it. I'll draw that up. Now it's John Pinto. He's going to do some math. Thank you, Richard. You got it. Take it away. All right. Yeah. Where is my presenter? OK. Are you seeing my presentation, or are you seeing my PowerPoint? I'm seeing your PowerPoint user Good. area, user. not the presentation. OK, why are you not using presenter view? I'm very fortunate. I have, two, I have an external monitor plugged in my laptop that makes this uh, much I got easier. It. There yep. we go. I got OK, here we go. All right, so this is mainly for visual observers uh, and mainly for our newer members. Um, who maybe uh, you know need a little introduction to some of the basic math that we use uh, pretty much every day when we're using our scopes. Um, I'll leave it to our astrophotography uh, experts to do a similar mini program for your basic astrophotography math. So uh, if you're not into visual observing, this is probably not of interest to you, but uh, if you're new to Visual observing, uh, these things are the basics. OK, so typically when you want to calculate anything regarding your, your telescope viewing, you need certain pieces of information about your telescope and about your eyepieces. You will need to know uh, the aperture of your telescope, basically how large is your objective lens or your mirror. So I'm going to use. Uh, one of my simple scopes uh, for the examples here. So I have a little 80 millimeter refractor. Uh, the other thing you need to know is the focal length of your telescope. Again, this is usually something that's printed right on your scope. Uh, my scope happens to be 400 millimeter focal length. There's also something called the focal ratio, which is just basically the focal length divided by your aperture. So sometimes you might just see that number and one of the other numbers, and you could just uh, calculate the, the missing third number if you don't know it. Uh, as far as an eyepiece for my examples, I'm going to just use my eight millimeter uh, uh, focal length eyepiece. And uh, something that you may not know, but you can probably find on the site where you bought your uh, eyepiece, is what its apparent field of view is. Uh, and again, the one I'm going to use is a 50 degree uh, eyepiece. Now, most eyepieces of different styles will have typically the same types of field of view. So this happens to be a Plossel eyepiece, and those typically will have a 50 degree field of view. And of course, you might want a calculator to do some of the math. All right, so probably the most basic thing you're going to want to calculate is the magnification of what you are looking through. Uh, and again, that's a really simple calculation. You take your telescope focal length, you divide it by your eyepiece focal length, and that will be your magnification. So my example, my 400 millimeter scope and my eight millimeter eyepiece gives me a 50 times magnification. 
This next one I am giving uh, props to uh, Richard, who uh, showed me this uh, a couple of years ago. I, I think this is really cool. And it gives you the idea that your telescope is really sort of like a spaceship. Um, as you increase your magnification, especially of things like the moon, it's uh, as if you are traveling to that object and getting closer. So how close are you? So I'm gonna use the moon as my example, 240,000 miles away at the, my 50 magnification uh, with my eyepiece. You take the distance to the uh, object, you divide it by your magnification and that's basically what the moon would look like if you were that far away from it. So at 4,800 miles. Something that maybe some people don't understand is there are magnification limits to your telescope. Um, and again, this is really simple to calculate. So for a, uh, a telescope of my 80 millimeter aperture, my focal length of 400 millimeters, you will find your maximum usable magnification to be twice your aperture size in millimeters. So again, my 80 millimeter reflector, times two, my maximum usable magnification is 160 times. If you try to go beyond that, it's what they call empty magnification, you're really not getting any more detail. In fact, you're probably just magnifying the uh, atmosphere at that point. And to get that magnification, um, you need to calculate what focal length you'll need. And that's really the magnification formula we were looking at, but just kind of turned upside down. So to get my 160 magnification, I divide that into the uh, focal length of my telescope. And it tells me I would need a two and a half millimeter eyepiece to achieve that. There's also, again, something most people may not know, there's actually a minimum magnification. And this has more to do with our eyes. Uh, if you don't magnify it enough, uh, you're not sending enough light to your eye for you to actually uh, get any benefit from your, from your telescope. So again, use my same examples. Uh, the minimum magnification is really your maximum magnification divided by 10 or 0.2 times your aperture in millimeters. So the minimum magnification that's useful on my telescope would be 16 times. And again, doing the calculation for the eyepiece, that would be a 25 millimeter eyepiece. So if I'm going out to buy um, eyepieces for my telescope, I'm gonna to wanna to make sure I stay within that range of two and a half millimeters to 25 millimeters to really make the best use out of my scope. Of course, for your scope with its uh, parameters, you're gonna get uh, different uh, numbers for your minimum and math, maximum uh, eyepiece sizes. Something we love to do as visual observers is separate stars, double stars. So how do you know if it's possible or what's possible with your telescope? So a very famous formula is your separation limit. Now, this number I'm gonna give you is with absolutely perfect seeing the atmosphere is totally still. You've got uh, you know, nothing jiggling around up there, twinkling. Um, so with my 80 millimeter telescope, you divide that number into 114 and you get your separation limit. So with my little telescope, I theoretically can separate double stars separated by 1.4 arc seconds. Uh, what's the minimum magnification you need to separate a particular double star you're interested in observing? Uh, to do that, you take 240 and you divide it by your uh, separation of your double star, and that will give you the minimum magnification you would need. So I just took an example of, let's say I really wanted to observe that double star that's separated by 1.4 arc seconds. So I divided that into 240 and I got 172 magnification. And that's a little bit higher than what I'm gonna call my uh, max magnification, my empty magnification, but if all you're trying to do is separate a double star, you, you probably go up, go over that a little bit. Uh, what is the maximum or minimum separation I could use at my maximum magnification? 
Uh, so to figure that out, you take 120, you divide it by your telescope aperture, and you find your smallest double star you can uh, view with your maximum magnification. You take 120, in my case, 120 divided by 80, and I get about 1.5 arc seconds. And uh, that's probably a better number than, uh, than that separation limit. Field of view, true field of view. Uh, this is also something that uh, is very good to know because when you're star hopping or just observing a, a, an area, you're gonna wanna know how big of a field of view are you actually looking at. Um, so <clears throat> to get your apparent, to get your true field of view, you need your eyepiece's apparent field of view and divide it by the magnification of, of that eyepiece in your telescope. So I'm gonna again take my running example here of an eyepiece with a field of view of 50 degrees. My eyepiece focal length is eight millimeters. My telescope focal length is 400 millimeters. So when I put that all together, how big is the sky, how big of the sky am I looking at uh, in my telescope? So first I need my magnification. So I divide my, uh, 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 Oh, that's a mistake. That's 400 by eight. I'll fix that before I publish this. And you get 50 as your magnification. Uh, you take your true field of view. My apparent field of view was 50 divided by the magnification of 50. So my true field of view using that eyepiece and my telescope gives me a one degree field of view. Uh, this is another, what I'll call theoretical uh, calculation, you probably very rarely will be able to go to this magnitude, but in case you happen to be outside and you have perfect transparency, the, you know, there's skies nice and clear, your limiting magnitude is 2.7 plus 5 times the log base 10 of your telescope aperture in millimeters. So again, I'm going to use our, my running example. So my 80 millimeter telescope uh, its log is 1.9, multiply that by five, that's 9.5. I add 2.7 to it and I get a limiting magnitude of 12.2 uh, as the dimmest star that I theoretically could view in that telescope. If you want to learn more about this and you find this interesting, uh, the Astronomical League publishes a great little uh, book uh, called Math for Amateur Astronomers. Not only does it have what I'm showing you, but it has a whole lot of other things, even to the point of teaching a little celestial navigation. And the Observer's Handbook from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada also has uh, some excellent uh, articles in there for calculating all kinds of things, including some of the things that I've, I've shown you here. Um, in fact, sometimes I like the calculations in this handbook actually better than the Astronomical League. So you take your pick as to which you, which you prefer. And at this point, that is my mini program and I'm open to any questions or corrections if you saw some in the, uh, in the presentation. If not, Richard, I guess, take I guess it we're good. All right. Well, I'm not going to take it away. We're going to let uh, Charles. Do you like to go by Charles or Taryn? Um, both. Different people like to call me different things. I'm I'm happy with both. Charles is my name. Taryn is something I've been called for a long time. Okay, good. Then I um, can't screw it up. Right. Well, <laughs> all right. So take it away then, Charles Taryn. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Let me see if I can get this screen share to work here. Um, all right, can everybody see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Now we're good now. All right, well, this is back to my history of astronomy series. I have been slowly walking people through a, a telemic or a, a pre-Copernican uh, uh, view of uh, how the heavens were understood. We started talking about some of the basics and we started also talking about uh, quadrants and uh, astrolabes and how they work 
And today we're going to talk a little bit about Sol and Luna, depending on how far we can get with our allotted time. Um, as a as a reminder, uh, this was the the scale. This armillary sphere represents this uh, Ptolemaic view of the heavens. Um, you have the circle going all the way around the Earth this way, which is the prime meridian. You have the center one, which is the celestial equator, the celestial tropics after that, and the uh, Antarctic circles um, even further there. You also have this big thick band with the zodiac signs on it, which is the ecliptic or the, uh, the path of the sun at this point in time it was considered to be. Uh, now we know it's our path, the path of the Earth. Um, but the, the stars of the heavens were all considered to be on a fixed kind of like sphere um, all the way around. If you remember me showing you guys this plastic monstrosity, which is just tiny there in my picture, um, it, um, it kind of illustrates how those thick stars would be. Now the planets, the sun and the moon, they were all considered to be wanderers because they kind of all traveled across the ecliptic. Um, here's another view to where we can see that a little bit better. In the center, we see the Earth um, and we see some fire around it. And then we see, we see the circle of the moon, the circle of Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And then you have the fixed stars all the way around it. And you can kind of see how um, that skeleton view would look then in, in a flat two-dimensional view. Um, so when we're talking about the sun, uh, the first thing to think about, we think about is equinoxes and solstices. This chart kind of gives an example of what some of those kind of things we're going to be talking about. We'll come back to it. An equinox is commonly regarded as the instant of time when the plane of the, uh, the, uh, the sun goes through the Earth's equatorial passes. Um, the word is Latin from the equinoctum, which literally means like equal night. Uh, and on the day of the equinox, there should be um, roughly equal um, times of day and night um, approximately all over the planet. In the Northern Hemisphere, the March equinox is called the vernal or spring equinox, while the September equinox is called the autumnal or fall equinox. The dates of the equinox changes uh, progressively during our leap year cycle. And um, because of that, we see uh, different combinations of our seasons. Um, in the 21st century, uh, the earliest March equinox will be March 19th, um, while around 2096, um, um, the last, uh, the latest was going to be around 2003 when March 21st was the equinox. With the September equinox, the earliest was going to be the 21st, and that was going to be in 2096 again. And then in 2003, uh, September 23rd. Now for solstices, a solstice is an event occurring when the sun appears to reach its most northern, northern or southerly excursion on its path. Um, the term solstice can be used in a broader sense as the day when this event occurs. Uh, a day of uh, solstice in the hemisphere would be either the most or the least amount of sunlight. Of course, uh, solstice is derived from the Latin word sol and sestir, which means to stand still. So here we see those, uh, the chart again. So we can see on the equinoxes um, is when the sun hits that equatorial plane, which again is, is imagined to go on forever throughout the earth. And then uh, the most northerly point for the summer solstice, and the most southerly point for the winter solstice. Now, how did the medieval people determine this? Well, one of the most famous ways and probably the most ancient of all astronomical tools was the gnomon, which can be a straight stick in the ground. Um, there, before we had these uh, digital and analog clocks, we, um, there was some, this idea of seasonal hours. We had 12 hours at night and 12 hours in the daytime, but the length of time would change according to how long um, because the daylight was divided into 12 equal hours and the nighttime was divided into 12 equal hours. So depending on how long or how short the day was would determine how long the time worked in that kind of uh, a system. Well, local noon is always the time when the shadow for the sun is measured the shortest according to the gnomon. Now the summer solstice is the shortest uh, noontime shadow and the winter solstice is the longest noontime shadow. So this seems very easy to figure out. 
But there's a lot of limitations when you do this because the moment of the solstice does not always occur at noon. And when you're comparing shadow plots, the sun can get very fuzzy. Uh, so you sometimes it's two or three days it takes to, it's difficult to determine exactly where the solstice occurred because of the, the fuzziness of your shadow plots. Another method, and this method was described in Ptolemy's Algamist, was the meridian quadrant. And uh, you made basically a, a quadrant with two pegs in it to where you could determine the length of uh, the length of shadow. And um, it the top peg is the shadow measurement and the bottom egg uh, serves as a plum, uh, more precise than the gnomon. And it reduces the uncertainty um, with shadow fuzziness. And this is more reliable for telling the equinoxes than it is for the solstice. It's hard to tell the sub solstice still because you need several Neemtain altitudes measurements and the solstice is not always at noon. However, it usually can get to the solstice within like a half day uh, range. Uh, this is another tool that was described in the Alchemist, the equatorial ring. Um, it's a large metal ring and it's aligned to the bee where it itself is always in the plane of the equator. Um, and so that's kind of a tricky thing to do uh, and to get it to stay at just that plane because you have to readjust it for wherever you are. And in the spring and summer, the sun on the top never shines on the bottom. And in the fall and the winter, the sun shines all day on the bottom face. Um, but at an equinox, the shadow of the top part of the ring will fall into the center strip of the ring where there'll be equal time equal strips above and below. Now you can, the useful thing about this is it can give you the exact moment of the equinox. But like I've said, it's very hard to get it in that plane to start with and even harder to keep it in that way. And um, refraction can sometimes give you false positives with the meridian quadrant, um, giving overall better results for things. Um, so there was a lot of conversations about how long a year was to be. So um, from the third century, they figured out it was roughly 365 and a fourth days. Um, differing calendars worked out different ways. Um, the tropical year from tropic to tropic, which is like solstice to solstice or equinox to equinox, turned out to be a little shorter, 365 and a fourth. Um, and there were suspicions early on that the length of the year was variable. However, uh, um, this uh, turned out to be uh, not true with observation, although it was a challenge to figure out how. Uh, seasonal days are not always constant um, and changed over time. For example, in the Middle Ages, the spring was the longest season, and these days our summer is the longest season. Um, all this spread and variation is uh, roughly referred to as the solar anomaly or solar inequality. Now, our solar theory is something that tries to work this out. A theory needs four parameters in order to make accurate predictions. It needs the length of the tropic year, which determines the rate of the, the sun's motion. It needs the longest apogee. This angle specifies the direction in which the center of the eccentric is located, as seen from Earth. It needs the eccentricity of the eccentric circle, the ratio of the Earth's center of the eccentric to the radius of the, the wider circle. And this specifies the amount by which the center of the eccentric circle is displaced from the Earth. And it also needs um, the, long the longitude of the sun at a particular moment. Uh, this was solved with two variously different models. Uh, one is called the Hipparchus eccentric circle model, and the other one is called the concentric deferent and epicycle model. Um, this was the more common of the two because uh, it, to use it, um, caused less offset uh, than the other one. Uh, the sun moves at a uniform speed. The earth is at the center um, and uh, the middle of the sun's orbits is equally displaced. Um, so um, the seasons are fully explained using this and the sun appears to move more quickly around perigee and more slowly about apogee, but this is because of distance. If you look at the picture here, we have the earth at the center, but all of the math is rotating from this zero point. And then you can kind of see all those other points that we looked at explained. And this picture here kind of gives you a variable of the different times. This being the summer solstice and winter solstice, autumnal equinox and vernal equinox. And uh, 
that kind of gives us a look of how that model would work. The other model was the concentric uh, deferred and epicycle model. This model is mathematically equivalent to the eccentric circle model. So no matter which math you use, it produces the same results. It does allow the Earth to be at the center, um, but it uses uh, epicycles and deference. Um, so here you have the Earth at the center, and then you have the, the orbit, but the orbit is not exactly orbiting itself. There's this point in the center around which the sun is moving around, which kind of shows us how all these different points would cause again. Um, and so this was a more complicated version of that, um, but both were the more mathematically equivalent to each other. And this is kind of how they worked out the solar year. Um, I think that may be a good spot to stop. So let me uh, stop my share and see if there's any questions about any of that. Looks like there's a good um, a good comment about the ecliptic. Ecliptic comes from eclipses because the ancients were able to figure out the actual plane of the ecliptic via solar eclipses during the new moon. I hadn't looked up that uh, etymology, but that looks that uh, that sounds very cool. And thank you for sharing that. And I hope that answered John Clinton, uh, John Pinto's question about can you explain why it's called the ecliptic um, a little bit because I never thought to really look at that particular um, point of view. Is there any other questions about any of this? It might be a bit um, rudimentary or it might be a bit advanced. I don't know where it stands. All right, well, I guess thank you all very much. And thank you, Charles, very much uh, for sharing uh, with us. Um, really, any members who are have a uh, passion project in astronomy or doing your own research, we would love for you to come on. You don't have to be a, a regular mini program. That would be great. Uh, but um, just, a, you know, a, uh, an update on what you're working on and the kind of uh, kind of research that you're doing, uh, that would be you know uh, of great interest, I think, to a lot of a lot of our members. So it is almost 9:30, and a lot of you have uh, stayed with us all the way to the end. So uh, thank you for giving us your time tonight. We hope we had a, a program that was uh, worth your time. Uh, I certainly enjoyed uh, all of the material tonight. Uh, so. Stay safe and uh, watch your inboxes for news about our uh, new website and um, information about our next uh, next meeting and events. Uh, everybody enjoy the uh, the goings on on Mars uh, in between. I think there'll be a lot of chatter on um, on our uh, groups IO mailing list about that. I know I'm going to be watching uh, probably with uh, a lot of the rest of you uh, when that goes down. So. Very exciting. So stay safe. Uh, see you all again in a month. Uh, board members, uh, less than that. And uh, have a good night. So thank you. Bye-bye. Night, Richard. Night.